November 8th. As we gather on this day, we are very mindful that our nation has gone through a tremendous election season. The results have now been published. As we move forward, we pray for healing for our nation to be unified around a new president as we anticipate a transition period and the inauguration of President-elect Biden. Today's worship themes cover justice and righteousness. May the scriptures guide our hearts as we also pray that the Holy Spirit and the truth would guide our nation. As a call to worship, I'll be reading from a portion of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. May the words of Scripture prepare our hearts as we enter into worship together through this recorded service. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. Gracious God, we pray for your wisdom and guidance in this time. Guide us as your children. Guide your church. And guide our nation. Amen. We want to be faithful, 
And as we move forward, we pray that your truth and your light would be a lamp for our feet so that we could live justly and follow a path of truth. We are grateful for answered prayers. We continue to pray for Peggy's daughter, Dory, who had to be admitted to the hospital but now has been released, and we pray that she will be restored to full strength as she recovers from her chemotherapy. We are very grateful that Charlene's daughter, Kathy, has come through her surgery, and we pray that having now gone through this surgery, that she will be fully restored through physical therapy, through physical healing, and that she will be able to return to life with no limitations. We are very grateful because George has shared that he's expected to get released from rehab by the end of this, this week. We pray for his continued strength and encouragement. We also are united together as Irene has asked prayers for her father and her mother, Louis and Betty. Be with them, strengthen them, encourage them. May they know your love and grace as they are prayed for, and may they know healing and strength from your hand. We also continue to name the names of individuals within our church. Kristen, Mildred, her daughter Debbie, Eleanor, Judy M, and family, Joy, and Doug, and Alice, and Tyler, and Colleen, and also Wally. Indeed, we pray for our whole entire church family just as we continue to pray for our neighbors, our co-workers, and those that we love and have a connection with in this world. Lord, we ask for your grace to shine in abundance. Now the challenge of a transitional period, may your truth and your wisdom guide all leaders in transition, especially as there has been an up an increased outbreak of the pandemic. We continue to pour our hearts out for those who have lost loved ones, for those who are physically ill. We pray for those who are serving through the medical communities in every level and every capacity. We ask for strength and encouragement. But we especially pray, gracious God, for the scientific community that continues to work hard for a vaccine. Our petition is, that an effective, safe vaccine would be produced just as soon as possible, and that this pandemic would be eradicated around the world. And until that time, we ask that your grace would be sufficient as we seek to live faithfully before you with wisdom, justice, and strength. We offer this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. 
Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion, only to meet a bear. As though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall, only to have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark, without a ray of brightness? I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring me choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. May God add a blessing to this, the reading of Scripture. As I was preparing for this sermon, I was reminded of a book that I read to, or we read to, our daughters as they were growing up. The title of the book, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Why would a children's author write such a book with a title such as that? Well, at least in part, in writing the book, it was the desire of the author to help parents teach their children how to deal with difficult days. To teach the full spectrum of life. Indeed, perhaps this prophet and this section of Amos was God's way of teaching first the Israelites about true life and now some 2,700 years later, teaching us about life and true life. Personal experience with lions and bears. I don't think too many of us have a lot of personal experiences, but again, as I thought about it, I found it amazing. Here this ancient prophet used an image that even to this day is something that we can connect with and that we can have some insight about the difficulty and the horrible situation, the terrible, horrible, very bad day described in this illustration. As far as lions, I remember distinctly as a young man going to the Buffalo Zoo. And as I went to the Buffalo Zoo, we went to the cat house, the lions and the tigers and bear, or lions, tigers, and leopards. And as we walked through, I remember distinctly there was a rail that was set back from the thick plexiglass cage. And then as I was looking at this lion that was, his shoulder was up against the plexiglass, it was so cl close and so vivid to look at his mane, to look at his eyes and how big they were, and his jaw, and the strength of his jaw. And at one point in time, he licked his lips with his tongue. And I looked at him and I thought, wow. That almost looks like our pet, our dog, and how the dogs at times will lick their lips. And I remember just being amazed by this magnificent animal. And as I turned and as I began to go to the next cage, there was a roar and a jump! Unbelievable! My heart was pounding and I turned around and I looked at this lion and I realized this was just a lazy roar. He just felt like letting it out. And made me realize if that was a lazy roar and fear and adrenaline that kicked in for me, what would it be like to face a lion face to face? Going on from the lion, there's bears. Well, as I share often, or I have shared over the years, my family having grown up in the Buffalo area, we had a cottage, we have a cottage north of Toronto. Well, if you want to see North American black bears, one of the best places to go is a transfer station. So the village of Dorset has a transfer station, and when you go, it's not uncommon 
to see bears. And I remember distinctly one summer seeing a mama bear. A mama bear and two cubs that were already pretty good size. And as I looked at those bears, and there are warning signs all over the place saying these are wild animals, keep your distance, you know, this is not something to treat casually. But at a distance looking and realizing this huge animal with a sizable, substantial size, that the head and the muscle seem almost disproportionately small. It almost seems like their chewing would not be all that vicious. Of course it would be. But what I remember was their claws. Those claws were just, even at a distance, the paws and claws and the power that represented in being able to rip through things. A word image, an illustration. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. You believe it's going to be light and a day of festivity, but I warn you, it's going to be dark, pitch dark. It's going to be a horrible, terrible, very bad day. And then he gives this illustration. And with the images that I've shared, we can imagine what it would be like to go out and have an encounter with a lion. Adrenaline kicks in and survival mode kicks in. And somehow, the individual is able to evade the lion. And as they're walking and on their way home, not only do they engage or do they escape the lion, but then they're faced with a bear. And now their adrenaline kicks in again and they're close to home, so they run for home. And they go through the door and they slam the door shut and they're leaning against the wall and they're panting and trying to catch their breath and they're thinking, I'm safe, only to be bitten by a snake. Not even the sanctuary of home is safe. And the power of this illustration, even to this day. Amos was a prophet from the south, and he traveled to Israel, the ten tribes of the north during the divided kingdom. And he warned them. See, during this period of time, some 250 years after King David reigned, Israel on the north looked like things were going wonderfully. The economy was good. Religious festivals and holidays, religious practice was booming. It looked spectacular. And yet, their hearts were far from God. You have abandoned justice and righteousness. And the prophet Amos warned them, you will be overtaken. The day of the Lord will be destruction. And he prophesied accurately that the Assyrians would overtake and conquer the 12 tribes of the north, Israel. Listen to these verses of behavior during the time of Amos. <clears throat> Hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon, moon be over that we may sell grain? A festival, a religious holiday. During religious holidays, you don't engage in normal commerce. And they're going, and they're, the festival is booming, and everything is going great, and everybody looks like they're very pious, and they have right standing before God, and in their hearts they say, I can't wait until this is over so I can go back to selling grain. And then it goes on, and the Sabbath be ended that we may go to market and sell our wheat. They didn't want to just engage in commerce, but how did they engage in commerce? It goes on to say, skimming on the measure, boosting the price, and cheating with dishonest scales. Buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Selling even the sweepings with the wheat. Justice, righteousness, justice is honesty. 
Justice is a worker who is worthy of their wage getting paid. Justice is having a scale that weighs properly. And further, we know from the law of Israel that there was provision to help when people were faithful to help the poor. So when a farmer would harvest their wheat, they wouldn't go to the extreme corners of their fields, but rather they would swing short and they would leave sections of the wheat unharvested. Why? Because then the poor of the communities could come in and they could gather wheat and provide for their families. And the threshing floor, they would go and they would harvest, but then they would leave the leftovers. They would leave it so that, again, individuals who were in need could come in and gather some of the wheat that was left over. But here Amos accuses them, not only are you gathering that which you thresh, but then you're sweeping it all up, the trample, the, the, that which is not as good a quality, and you're mixing it in with the wheat to maximize your profits, your dishonest profits. Public religious holidays and ceremonies, all time high, while corruption was rampant. Warning. Woe. The day of the Lord will come as a day of judgment, and it will judge not your outward signs, but your heart and your behavior. How do we understand? The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a dramatic change that is out of our personal control. So, for example, a dramatic change that's out of our personal control, none of us chose a global pandemic and to live through it. None of us choose earthquakes. I was already at church, and when my wife arrived, she shared that Weymouth experienced an earthquake this morning. I've never been any place that had an earthquake. I didn't feel it here in Hingham. An event that's outside of our personal control. National events, recessions, depressions, the result of a presidential election. It's bigger than any one of we also can think of personal loss, the loss of a job, the unexpected death of a loved one, the diagnostic results of a doctor saying, you have cancer. These are events that reflect the day of the Lord. There's a larger dynamic at hand. And the Bible teaches us that there is indeed a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. What do we do? How do we prepare for days of the Lord which are blessings? Days of the Lord which will challenge us to the very core of our being. Amos' message is, whatever it looks like on the outside, God sees the heart. The heart and how individuals choose to behave. How can we be close to God? Let justice flow like a river. Personal choices. Personal choices in our individual behavior, how we live as families, how we live as a church family, as citizens. We are each called to do our part. A colleague at a recent meeting shared the following parable, and I want to read it for you at this time. Once upon a time, two brothers living on adjoining farms, John the eldest and Joshua the youngest, had a terrible fight. It was the first serious rift in 40 years of farming side by side. Sharing the machinery and trading labor and goods as needed, the relationship began to fall apart over a slight misunderstanding that grew until it exploded into an exchange of bitter words, followed by weeks of silence. One morning there was a knock on John's door and he opened it to find a shabby little man with an ancient carpenter's toolbox. I'm looking for a few days' work, he said. Perhaps you have a few small jobs here that I might help you with. 
Yes, John said, I do have a job for you. Look across the creek at that farm. That's my neighbor. In fact, it's my younger brother. Last week there was a meadow between us, but he took his bulldozer, and now there's a creek. He did this to spite me, but I will do him even better. See that pile of lumber by my barn? I want you to build an eight foot fence so that I won't see his face or place anymore. The carpenter said, I'll do a job that will make you happy. John helped the carpenter get ready and then he was off for the day. The carpenter worked hard all day, measuring and sawing and nailing. And when John returned at sunset, the carpenter had just finished his job. John's jaw dropped. There was no fence. Instead, the carpenter had built a bridge that stretched from one side of the creek to the other. It was a beautiful piece of work with handrails and all. John's brother Joshua crossed the bridge and with tears in his eyes hugged him. John, you're a better man than I am to build this bridge after all I have said and done. The happy brothers turned to see the carpenter hoisting his toolbox on his shoulder. And John said, no, wait, please stay a few days. I have a lot of other projects. Thank you, I would love to stay, said the carpenter. But there are so many more bridges still needed to be built. Build bridges of civil, political conversation. Building bridges of reconciliation within the family. Building bridges in primary relationships that have been damaged. What does the Lord require? To do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before God. Justice and righteousness. Woe to those whose hearts are not with God. Amen. Amen.